Bottom Line, presented by Vantage Circle, is a web series that sifts through the noise, discussing the latest thinking regarding employee rewards and recognition. Today's guest is David Prieto, people scientist, organizational consultant, and podcast host. David, thanks for joining me today. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. We're talking about one of my favorite subjects when it comes to rewards and recognition, and that's the idea of science. And I say that, David, as you know, because oftentimes rewards and recognition gets distilled down to this fluffy conversation around, you know, we have to give people a pat on the back and carrot versus stick and, you know, some tired analogies that are really anchored in historical management thinking. We fast forward to today's reality, and there's lots of great information and scientific studies and research that supports the case, both for business, but also for people's wellness around rewards and recognition. And that's going to be the subject of today's conversation. I guess before we get into the the meat of the conversation, maybe just walk our audience a bit through your background, your experiences and credentials, and how they might relate to people science. Yeah. So as you touched upon, I am a people scientist. I do have a graduate degree in industrial organizational psychology, and that's essentially looking at how psychological principles apply in the workplace. It's a very nuanced and slice field within the broader umbrella of psychology. So I've had a chance to work in this field for roughly 15 years now in some of the largest organizations within California, both in the public sector as well as the private sector. So I've had an opportunity to see what these concepts look like from both perspectives, what works, what doesn't, and how recognition rewards can really help an organization empower and drive initiatives moving forward. That's great. And it's a great starting point for the conversation. I think let's start with the basics. Yeah. Maybe walk for those of us who aren't familiar, like myself, lay people when it comes to the science. What is the psychology of recognition? How does it affect people? What does it mean? How does it manifest itself from a psychological and scientific perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're looking at recognition fundamentally from a psychological perspective. It's a feedback mechanism. And from an evolutionary perspective, especially in evolutionary psychology, feedback is how we derive as people if we're working towards a particular project or a particular goal. So the feedback we get, evolutionarily speaking, is if we're hungry, we start feeling something in our gut. That's our gut giving us feedback that we need to engage in this goal to make sure we can resolve that need. Kind of fast forwarding to today's workplace and how individuals are engaging in work today, recognition is a variation of that very same feedback. In order to maintain our trajectory in accomplishing a specific goal, we need to receive feedback as employees to let us know, one, are we doing a good job? And two, am I on the right path? So looking at it holistically, Recognition can be seen as a variation of feedback, which is a fundamental uh, mechanism we use as people, uh, for lack of a better term, as animals, to be able to keep striving towards and accomplishing various goals. What happens when you don't receive recognition and feedback in the inverse? That's a great question. And so from a human perspective, we don't know if we're heading towards a particular target. We don't know if we're getting closer or if we're getting further away. And so because we aren't aware of the feedback or recognition that's given to us, we don't know if we're going to be able to reach whatever goal we're trying to accomplish. And that could lead to a couple of different emotions within an individual. It could lead to frustration. It could lead to confusion. It could lead to anxiety, potentially depression. I know a lot of these emotions are tied to how individuals feel in the workplace. So we're starting to see or have seen these kind of emotions start to start to rise in the workplace. And one potential cause, not saying it's the only, but is the unclarity of feedback or recognition for individuals engaging in particular goals. So if an employee is engaging in work, nobody's telling them they're doing a good job or they're on or off target, that can start leading to a feeling of anxiety. And that starts to ramp up the longer someone goes without being able to be provided that feedback or that recognition. And it may get to a place where, you know, an individual may completely disengage from what they're doing in the workplace, or they may engage in what's called uh, counterproductive work behaviors. So they may start calling in sick. They may start stealing. They may become aggressive, all from not being able to be provided feedback and or recognition, just simply letting someone know you're on target or if you're off target, these are ways to get you back on the rails. I think that's a really good point. I think when we talk about rewards and recognition, people get these images in their heads of like, you know, 
parties in the lunchroom and balloons right. and banners. And that can be part of your rewards and recognition strategy. But what you're talking about here really is a basic human need around, am I doing a good job? Communication, affirmations around whether we're on the right track or not. And I think, especially now in today's you know hybrid work culture, where Many of our workplaces have people working remotely in the office, a combination of the two. Even more important that we're touching base with our colleagues on a consistent basis. And if you're a leader, all the more important that you're providing intentionality with providing feedback to connect with your colleagues so that they understand, to your point, are we on track? Are we achieving the mm-hmm. goals we set out to achieve? You know, when we don't employ, as far as I last checked, you know, a bunch of mind readers, we need to provide people right. with perspective on what's happening, where we are, where we're going, how we're going to get there. But I think you've done a really nice job of encapsulating the science behind it. Because I mm-hmm. think beyond just the right thing to do in a moral context, there's very much a deficit that exists when you're not able to connect with people and see them where they're at. Yeah, 100%. And yeah, so I think like you touched upon, having that feedback in the form of recognition can really empower individuals. A little bit of a a tangent or a side note, individuals today receive so little feedback and so little recognition that even the littlest nugget, the littlest seed can really be overwhelming for some people to, uh, to accept. I'll give you an example. So my wife, who is an HRBP, um, she helps an organization deal with various, uh, people initiatives. And she had a chance to speak with a frontline worker who works in health services and essentially thanked him for doing a good job. He became very emotional in a good way, where he was very proud and very excited that what he was engaging in was being recognized and in this case, rewarded. Just a simple, great, keep it up. That little bit of acknowledgement, that little bit of recognition, that little bit of feedback was enough to have him have this feeling of being overwhelmed and thankful. Thank you for seeing me, for recognizing me, and for letting me know I'm doing a good job and I'm on the right path. So I think moving forward, potentially as a society, we have an opportunity to be more deliberate in how we recognize and how we provide that feedback. You know, David, you and I have both hosted a lot of workshops, facilitated conversations in organizations, and both of us have worked in the Fortune 100 company sphere. So we understand the complex nature of big organizations and how sometimes big companies can equal a, almost an, a lack of personality because it's just so big, it's hard to really establish you know, who are all the people you know, in, in the matrix, as it were. And I think, you know, when I've ever held these sessions, whether it's in the context of employee engagement, leadership sessions, one of the activities I always like to ask is, you know, as a, as a leader, as an employee, you know, how many, show of hands, how many of you receive enough feedback? And then predictably, to your earlier point, most people <laughs> don't put their hands up. And then the question we ask next is, how many of you are providing feedback consistently to your colleagues, coworkers, and your to your reports? And a similar number of people also yep. keep their hands down. So I think it's very much a self-fulfilling prophecy. We all have this, to your point, innate need to be recognized, to be thanked, to be acknowledged, to be seen. And when we do that, it doesn't have to have all the trappings of you know, pomp and circumstance. It can really just be, to your point, a simple, hey, I see the work that you're doing here. Thank you so much. And when we think about the healthcare industry, I can't think of an industry that has been put through the ringer more in the last three plus years in the healthcare industry, helping us get through multiple ways of a pandemic, aging population, resources constrained. Like that's a that's an industry where they're likely the deficit when it comes to recognition. So good on your spouse for introducing yeah. that. You know, as we tie things to from reward and recognition into engagement, you know, I'd love for you to talk a bit about the science between engagement, reward, recognition, and engage- and motivation. I think you know one thing I've said a number of times, whether on LinkedIn or on podcasts myself, is there's an inextricable link between you know engagement, discretionary effort, and intrinsic motivation. So let me break that down for people who may not be familiar with the terms. Intrinsic motivation comes from within. It's not external. It's not based on feedback from other people or by your compensation plan or by you know having your name up on an employee of the month placard. Intrinsic motivation is that self-motivating drive that we all have to varying degrees. Discretionary effort is essentially the effort that you provide to your job to go above and beyond what's absolutely expected of you. So most people will say, hey, if you're being paid for a job, you should do that job and do it to the best of your abilities. But there are some people that consistently go above and beyond the requirements of the job, and that generally comes intrinsically. They generally are compelled to provide that support because they feel a motivation to do that for whatever reason. 
And that ultimately leads to engagement and ultimately organizational performance. So maybe you just talk a bit about the science between the linkages in those areas. How does psychology play into the concept of rewards and recognition, but ultimately employee motivation and engagement? Yeah, I'm glad you noted that. So from an IO or industrial organizational psychology perspective, there are a, a, quite a bit of theories tying different ways to approach work or different potential reasons why individuals may be motivated, motivated to engage in those discretionary efforts. Just a quick uh, quick note from a, a, a IO psychologic, psychological perspective, we have a term for that discretionary effort. It's called organizational citizenship behaviors or OCBs for short. So it's essentially individuals who go above and beyond, you know, they, they are willing to stay late or willing to bring coffee to the, to the office and essentially engage in those responsibilities outside the typical job description. Now, with that aside, there are, there are a couple of different approaches when it comes to motivation. As you touched upon, there's the internal versus external, uh, factors that can contribute to somebody being motivated. And the one theory that I'm thinking of is the XY theory of motivation. And so what that is from a psychological perspective, if individuals adhere to the X uh, approach to, to motivation, it essentially postulates that individuals are inherently lazy. It's the sticks version of the carrots and sticks version of motivation. So individuals are inherently lazy. They don't want to do their work. They don't want to engage in anything. So leaders or other individuals need to engage in behaviors that are that help mediate that fact that individuals are lazy. So I need to put in punishments or I need to put in certain processes in place to get this individual motivated. More of an external approach to, to trying to get someone engaged in work. There's the opposite of that, which is the theory why theory of motivation where individuals are inherently motivated to engage in work or to engage in, in goal-seeking behavior. So as a leader, what we need to do is start removing some of the barriers that individuals have that remove that intrinsic motivation. Going back from an evolutionary perspective, do we need to be motivated as people or as humans to go get something to eat, to drink a sip of water, to you know be curious? to engage in, in passion projects. Not necessarily, we're intrinsically motivated and we move towards wanting to engage in those type of behaviors. So theory why really aligns with that perspective. It's removing things that get in the way of that intrinsic motivation. On the flip side, there are individuals, as I touched upon, that have that theory X, where there needs to be something, you know, some kind of stick to be able to, to motivate individuals. So that's one approach to looking at employee motivation. Another is the tried and true, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where as needs, individuals have essentially baseline needs. And in order for them to progress to the next level, those baseline needs need to be met. So fundamentally, from an organizational perspective, are they providing a means where individuals' physical characteristics, physical needs, you know, hunger, thirst, things of that nature, are those being satisfied? If so, individuals then transition to the next level of motivation, which is psychological safety or being comfortable, confident in, in working in their environment. From there, individuals then progress to having a sense of belonging. So do I belong in this organization? Is it providing me an opportunity to be my authentic self? Um, as individuals progress up this, this hierarchy, they start to get more engaged and more uh, uh, deliberate in the, the work that they're going to be doing. Then it goes to esteem. And then the last is being self-actualized. So we have theory X, theory Y, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Both of those can be used in different combinations to be able to motivate individuals uh, either intrinsically or extrinsically towards accomplishing a goal. One that I'm really interested in and I have found to be just an interesting theory of motivation to employ motivation in the workplace is Room's VIE model. So this is a very nuanced uh, motivational theory. And so I'm going to break it down here. So the V stands for valence and essentially is this organization is going to provide me with some kind of reward. Something's going to happen in which I'm going to gain, gain something. As an employee, do I value that particular reward? So that's what the V stands for. The I is, okay, from an employee perspective, if I engage in these behaviors or meet this particular uh, goal or accomplish this particular initiative, 
accomplishing that will lead to me earning what I deem valuable or not. And the E essentially stands for expectation that I, as an employee, can expect that I can accomplish that goal or engage in those behaviors, which will then lead to the goal or reward that I value. So these, this combination of different motivational theories all come into play and organizations leverage them in using different levers to be able to engage or really push individuals to try to accomplish uh, whatever goal, whatever initiative, whatever they're trying to do. And so it's kind of difficult to be able to say which one applies where Mm -hmm. each organization uses them, you know, to different degrees, but it's essentially a combination of those three broad theories that either empower internal or external motivation for, for employees. Well, and I think, thank you for providing that summary. Those are three great models to explain employee motivation from different vantage points. And I think each people who are listening to this can take a bit from those. I mean, I think we all can identify with the X, Y axis conversation. And I would encourage people who are watching, listening to this podcast to ask themselves, where do you think that you fall on that axis? Are you more of an X person or a Y person? I think most people I've met and, you know, my sample size is certainly not scientifically based, but I've spent 20 years in the human resources profession, predominantly in retail, where I interacted with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of employees from all age groups, demographics, walks of life, new people into Canada and the United States among localized citizens and on the like. And my experience has been that the vast majority of people fall on the why side of that axis. And that if you remove barriers, if you provide them with support, if you connect the goals to their performance and you treat them like human beings, most people get up in the morning every day and they want to do good work. They want to feel proud about their work. And there are external factors that come into play that may prevent people from doing that in small windows of time. If you're having problems at home or you have some anxieties around the current state of the economic model in the United States right now, that could, of course, drive different levels of anxiety, which may impede your ability to deliver performance, but strip away all those externalities. I have a belief and maybe a strong bias that people more often than not fall on that Y side of the axis. But I think your point's well taken. Organizations are applying these models today, but they're doing so informally. Mm -hmm. This is where bias and moral judgments come into play because you definitely, if we were to poll leaders, we were to poll executives, we were to poll boards, C-suite individuals, we would get a difference of opinion around people's belief around how they view themselves versus how they view other people. They would get difference of opinions around Maslow's hierarchy of needs and whether or not you need to satisfy people's you know more baser requirements before you start to require or expect self-actualization. But I think to your point, one thing I've taken away from this conversation is the level of intentionality that's being applied when it comes to these models is lacking in most organizations. But by at least having the conversation in an open and transparent way, you can surface some of these conversations, surface some of these deeply held moral beliefs and people's perspectives, and at least work towards consensus or at least some form of consensus where if we understand and we apply these principles in a thoughtful way in the organization, then we can start to align our strategies, our programs, our technology, our policies, our ways of working when it comes to small teams, leaders, large teams, divisions, and broader organizations really to realize the outcomes. Because regardless of your belief, most people in an organization are incentivized, both personally and collectively, to see that firm do really, really well. We want to see our organization be winning. We want to see us be winning. But we don't want to see us trading off one for the other. Most people would be uncomfortable having personal success if it was at the expense of their team. And most people would be upset with the idea of the organization winning and they're uh, they're losing, to use a tired analogy. So I think your point's really well taken in trying to find the intentionality to surface the conversation and to bring this to the individuals that can actually influence those elements inside of an organization. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head where we organizations do need to be more intentional. From an employee and supervisor perspective, they may be leaning on different theories of motivation and engaging in different behaviors. So the employee may be focused more on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but mm. the supervisor may be leveraging more that X, Y uh, theory of, of motivation. And they're using two, not competing, but just parallel and not overlapping theories of motivation. And so that may lead to some kind of conflict, which may lead to some kind of miscommunication, potentially uh, in disruptive behaviors or disengaging behaviors. So I really like your point of organizations being more intentional in outlining the theory they're trying to align with, Mm 
and how it represents itself or how it comes to life within the organization itself. Let's pivot slightly. We talked a little bit about the psychology of reward and recognition, but we covered over it quite quickly. I'm curious, from a psychological perspective, getting back to the science, what types of recognition are most effective when considering driving positive behavioral change? Yeah, that's a great question. And I wish it were simple, but there are a lot of variables that need to be taken to taken into account. And so let me let me start from the the most immediate. From an individual personality perspective, individuals enjoy recognition in predominantly two different ways. There are those extroverted individuals who really are happy to have, you know, the the parade, to have the party, to have, you know, the the confetti coming off uh, of, from the ceiling where a supervisor or a teammate or an organization says, you know, this person does great. Kind of opposite where we have individuals who are more um, the opposite of uh, ex, uh, extroverted, introverted. I'm sorry, I had a brain fart there. But individuals who are more introverted, they prefer being pulled aside where a supervisor or a teammate tells them in a more intimate uh, relationship, possibly one-on-one, I really enjoy what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. So those are two drastically different ways to recognize somebody. And so from an individualistic perspective, it's really going to come down to what does the individual prefer? Now, let's bring it up a little bit. Now, let's look at the team environment. What's the culture of a team? So in a sales environment where individuals are typically competing against one another, uh, competition is encouraged. And that's where being more outright or more Uh, what's the word, bombastic, in how individuals are being recognized, it may be appropriate there. Whereas maybe somewhere, maybe an an accounting team uh, where there's not, you know, extroverts aren't typically attracted to that uh, type of work. Maybe it's that more subtle, let me pull you to the side, let me recognize you uh, in silence. So we have individual, team, then we have organizational culture. What is appropriate for a particular organization? Are they more in line with you know, the big showcases of employee recognition, or are they more subtle, more reserved, and they're more, you know, let's send out an email, or let's send out a memo, let's do it more uh, on an intimate basis. Taking it one step or or one level above that is culturally, looking, you know, potentially east versus west, uh, how culturally what is appreciated or was it expected in terms of recognizing employees. I know uh, typically more individualistic cultures, they do Individuals from those cultures typically prefer or uh, lean towards, you know, a big celebration, a big, you know, recognition of accomplishment, whereas individuals from more collectivistic cultures see that as almost boastful or almost, uh, you know, uh, borderline arrogant. And so that that big celebration is kind of frowned upon. So each one of those levels determines what's appropriate uh, for an individual in terms of recognizing the work that they're doing. So with all of that said, with all of those variables taken into account, from a supervisor's perspective, what I have seen work the best is a supervisor essentially asking the employee, if I want to recognize you for a job well done, what would resonate the most with you for me to show my appreciation? And so that that would be my recommendation. Well, I love how you made the complex really simple at the end there, because you're right. And for those individuals that don't have experience in developing these complex plans, especially in global organizations... I think you've beautifully outlined the nuances at the individual, at the team, at the organizational, and then in the, potentially the regional perspective that all come into right. play. You know, I've worked like you have, David, in a lot of global organizations where for things like engagement surveys, we could expect very different results from our colleagues in Japan than we could in the United States and in Germany as compared to Brazil. And, you know, breaking that down to the team level, to the individual level, you start to see those nuances. And I think, you know, when you look at rewards and recognition, meeting people where they're at is really the name of the game here. But in the simple, simple way of doing that is just asking people what they're, what they would appreciate. And as a leader, that's why we don't give people 50 direct reports. We we supposedly have (laughs) spans of control that allow you to build relationships with your colleagues where you get to know know, what is the, what is the lever that we can pull to really incentivize that positive behavior. And at the same time, there are rituals inside of organizations that are important that we want to foster so that we can signal what good behavior looks like in some cases. So I thought you did a really nice job articulating that. You know, as we talk about recognition, you know, we've talked a lot about recognition in the context of the organization providing it to the employee and the supervisor providing it to the employee. But I'd love to hear from your perspective, 
the differences between those two modalities and what how it's different than when a peer provides recognition to another peer? Yeah, so that's a, a, a great question. And based on conversations I've had, based on different engagement surveys, I've had an opportunity to be a part of one of the or two of the most critical relationships an employee can have is with their peers and their supervisor. And so that dynamic is interesting, being that from a peer perspective, those are individuals we're going to be working with on a day-to-day basis. We're in the trenches with them, you know, where we're trying to work through some kind of complex problems. And that's where employees really start to develop those really strong bonds. And so receiving positive feedback or seeing recognition from individuals who we've gone through the trenches with can be really a powerful way to recognize employees. I think organizations have an opportunity an opportunity to really flush that out and what that looks like so that employees can provide one another and be excited to provide one another that positive recognition, that feedback that we're in this together, we're doing a great job, we're doing what we need to do. This is partly the reason why individuals who go off to war, they develop such deep and lasting relationships with their fellow, you know, individuals who are on the front lines with them. They're in the trenches together, they're developing those deep bonds. They're giving each other constant, consistent feedback. I need your help with this, need your help with that. And so those relationships can be really powerful and really, really deep for individuals. The next level above that is the supervisor. So there is the opportunity for supervisors to be more intentional and deliberate in how they're providing feedback. Although it's, you know, employees want it and and they yearn for it. It doesn't have, depending on how it's structured, it can be as powerful as the feedback individuals get from their peers. But there is always, at least from my perspective, this uh, this grain of salt, if you will, that the supervisor hasn't been there with us day in and day out. They haven't been struggling like me and my peers have. I appreciate it. I do like it, but it's it's a little different and it's a different perspective. And from an organizational perspective, not saying that it's not valuable, but it is the furthest removed from really appreciating what an employee is doing on the front lines, what their day-to-day obligations or expectations are. It's great that an organization is able to recognize and and provide that positive feedback, but it may not have, it may not be as meaningful or have as long lasting effect as that feedback and recognition we get from our peers who who were who are engaging in the work with us. No, I think that's a really good point. It certainly backs up my experience in managing and architecting and designing surveys for millions of employees across multiple industries. That relationship between the employee and the supervisor and the employee to the broader team, those are incredibly important. And they're far more important than the employee's connection to the broader organization Mm -hmm. because that affects their day-to-day life on a more consistent basis. And you know, one thing I've always been curious by is the more research I've done, the more insights I've looked into. The idea of friendships at work and building those bonds, you mentioned going through shared experiences. I I haven't been in combat, but I've certainly been through the proverbial trenches when it comes to some difficult internal projects, restructuring efforts, downsizings, mergers and acquisitions that, of course, meant long hours, very challenging circumstances, high pressure. And it shouldn't surprise people to hear that those are some of my best friendships, looking back on my experiences in different workplaces, are the people that I would spend hours and hours and hours with in terms of going through those ups and downs, the idea of building trust through, you know, trials and tribulations, just so important. I think the one thing I want to leave people with as we wrap up today's conversation is the beautiful thing around rewards and recognition is that yes, organizations should put intentionality behind their practices. They should link rewards and recognitions to the psychology of their employee base. They should use technology and tools and resources to be able to ensure that they can create a consistent and as best they can equitable experience for employees so that we can incent to meet people where they're at and provide some individualization using technology to do that. And the fastest way to breed recognition in your organization is from the ground up and it's contagious. And if you start by recognizing the people around you saying, hey, David, thank you so much for joining me today in this podcast. I learned a ton. I really enjoyed it. I One, I learned a lot, but I also thought it was a great conversation. That's going to be a, a great, great piece of feedback for you to, pr- to take away from today's conversation. And we'll hopefully you'll be able to bring that for the rest of your day, which might have greater feedback for you than if you know later on today, your boss had a separate conversation with you. So I think for folks who are listening, understand that you are part of the solution in your organizations to really drive this. And David, with that said, I do want to thank you for your time today. Um, you know, I'll give you the final word. Any final parts you want to leave with our audience in today's conversation? 
Yeah, no, I just want to thank you for the time, Matt. I appreciate it. And if anyone wants to find out what I'm doing, you can find me, uh, David Prieto, on LinkedIn. Uh, as we touched upon at the beginning, I do have my podcast too, the I303 podcast, which you can find on Spotify. That's great. I encourage people to check this out. Again, HR professionals, we are increasingly being put through the ringer. Their demands upon our profession are only increasing as the world becomes more complex. Let's leverage resources like David. Let's look to institutions like the scientific community to provide us with answers, because I think we'll find that in a lot of cases, we're working really, really hard, but we can be leveraging resources around us to be even more effective. So thank you for your time, David. Looking forward to staying in touch. Sounds good. Thank you.